do you think we will one day spend most or all of our lives in uh, virtual reality worlds? I have always found the very most valuable moment in virtual reality to be the moment when you take off the headset and your senses are refreshed and you perceive physicality uh, afresh, you know, as if you were a newborn baby, but mm. with a little more experience. So you can really notice just how incredibly strange and delicate and peculiar and impossible the real world is. Um, so, so the magic is and perhaps forever will be in the physical world. Well, that's my take on it. That's just me. I mean, I think I don't get to tell everybody else how to think or how to experience virtual reality. And at this point, there have been multiple generations of younger people who've come along and liberated me from having to worry about these things. <laughs> uh, but I, I should say also, even in uh, what some, well, I called it mixed reality back in the day, and these days it's called augmented reality. Uh, but with something like a HoloLens, even then, like one of my favorite things is to augment a forest, not because I think the forest needs augmentation, but when you look at the augmentation next to a real tree, the real tree just pops out as being astounding. You know, it's it's interactive, it's changing slightly all the time if you pay attention, and it's hard to pay attention to that, but when you compare it to virtual reality, all of a sudden you do. And even in practical applications, uh, my, my favorite early application of virtual reality, which we prototyped going back to the 80s when I was working with Dr. Joe Rosen at Stanford Med, near, near where we are now, uh, we made the first surgical simulator. And to go from the fake anatomy of the simulation, which is incredibly valuable for many things, for designing procedures, for training, for all kinds of things, then to go to the real person, boy, it's really something. Like, uh, surgeons really get woken up by that transition. It's very cool. So I think the transition is actually more valuable than the simulation. That's fascinating. I never really thought about that. It's almost, it's, it's like traveling elsewhere in the physical space can help you appreciate how much you value your home once you return. Well, that's how I take it. I mean, um, once again, people have different attitudes towards it. All are welcome. What do you think is the difference between the virtual world and the physical meat space world that that you are still drawn, for you personally, still drawn to the physical world? Like there clearly then is a distinction. Is there some fundamental distinction or is it the peculiarities of the current set of technology? In terms of the kind of virtual reality that we have now, uh, it's made of software and software is, is terrible stuff. Yeah, Software is always the slave of its own history, its own legacy. <laughs> it's always um, infinitely arbitrarily messy and arbitrary. Working with it brings out a certain kind of nerdy personality in people, or at least in me, mm -hmm. which um, I'm not that fond of. And there, there, are, there are all kinds of things about software I don't like. <laughs> and so that's different from the physical world. It's not something we understand, as you just pointed out. On the other hand, you know, I'm a little mystified when people ask me, well, do you think the universe is a computer? And I have to say, well, I mean, what on earth could you possibly mean if you say it isn't a computer? If it isn't a computer, it wouldn't follow principles consistently and it wouldn't be intelligible because what else is a computer ultimately? You know, I mean, and, and we have physics, we have technology, you know, so we can do technology so we can program it. So, I mean, of course, it's some kind of computer, but I think trying to understand it as a Turing machine is probably a foolish approach. Right. That, that's the question, whether it, it performs, this computer we call the universe performs the kind of computation that can be modeled as a, a universal Turing machine, or is it something much more fancy? so fancy, in fact, that we it may be beyond our cognitive capabilities to understand. Turing machines are kind of, um, I'd call them teases in a way, because <laughs> like, if you have an infinitely smart programmer with an infinite amount of time, an infinite amount of memory, and an infinite clock speed, then they're universal. But yeah. that cannot exist. So they're not universal in practice. And they, they actually are in practice, a very particular sort of machine within, you know, the constraints within the conservation principles of any reality that's 
worth being in probably. <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I, uh, uh, I think universality of a particular model is probably a deceptive way to think, even though at some sort of limit, of course, it's can it something like that's got to be true at some sort of high enough limit, but it's just not accessible to us. So what's the point?